Uh, you're listening to the Investigative Journal. I'm your host, Greg Szymanski. Two hours, two hours with uh, great interviews all the time. We get into the news behind the scenes that the uh, mainstream media refuses to cover. What a shame. Uh, let me just update some things before I tell you who my guest is today. I've been promoing it all week, and we're going to get deep inside the family, the order, the Illuminati, uh, today for two hours. And uh, you got to stay with us from the beginning to the end of this interview. Okay, we're back. It's eight minutes after the hour, and uh, we're going to get deep inside the Illuminati, the family, the order. We have a guest uh, that was involved with this group, uh, born into it uh, for over 30 years, and uh, her name is Zvali. Zvali, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am. Well, it's nice to have you here, and I know you don't give radio interviews, and I really want to thank you because I think it really does help the American people understand about this uh, secret organization that you were born into. So I guess before we, uh, you know, I guess we can just start from the beginning and tell us uh, uh, right from the beginning you were born into this from wealthy parents, and tell us about your training in this group and uh, uh, when you were a young child and then up into your orientation at the Vatican. Go ahead. That's a pretty broad area, though, Greg. I mean, that could take okay. hours, if you know what I mean. Um, yes, but, but do you know, just uh, if you yeah. could just outline it for us. Yeah. I mean, I was born in a group. I was born in Germany, came to the U.S. very young, um, and basically went through um, all the training that the group, all members of the group do under uh, training to different degrees, depending on the role. Um, after... Uh, by the time I was a teenager, I was a youth leader, and by the time I was uh, 22, I became the youngest member of leadership council in San Diego County. And at that time, I was a head trainer. Um, I was the sixth trainer. I eventually moved up to the second position. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was 12, I I had mentioned with you the ceremony in at the Vatican. Uh, that they right. really do make all, all leadership in the group undergo at some point. Now, uh, can you now basically when you were growing up, I remember you told me that you were instilled at a young age. Uh, you were born to a very wealthy, uh, well-to-do family. You moved yes. back to the states. You were told at a very young age you were special. You were chosen. Uh, cor uh, correct. Well, they tell everyone in the group that they're special and chosen. And, in fact, that's one of the things that made me very cynical when I was older is that, you know, I mean, you will never meet a person who's an Illuminati who's not been told and programmed for years that they're special, they're the only one that can do things for, quote, unquote, family. But I was told, yes, you know, I would do great things for family one day. And um, the reason why, I guess, I can filter some of this with objective view is I know what my role in the group was, and it was over quite a significant number of other people. So I don't evaluate what I my role or specialness within the group, not so much by what I was told, but what by what I did. So you reach the age of 12, and then you're told by your parents you're going to an induction ceremony in the Vatican. Uh, can you yes. tell us uh, how that happened and what? occurred at that ceremony when you went there? Okay. Um, this isn't easy to talk about, as you know. Um, when I was 12, uh, I was flown over to Germany, and I was at, I'll call him the German father's house over there, and there was some preparation for a few days beforehand, and I was told that there would be a very important ceremony, and it was considered a sealing ceremony at that point. And Basically, I was told a little bit about what I was expected to do during the ceremony. You know, when we got there, um, we went to the Vatican. Um, there's underneath the Vatican. There's a, there's a large room that I described to you when we talked before. Um, it's it it has 13 catacomb chambers leading into it with with, and what they do is is they as you go down these these steps into the the room. You can see that they're, they're, it's almost circular, and so they're all around it, and they bring out mum, the mummies from the catacombs, and they set them beside each one, and they say that the spirits of the fathers watching over the ceremony. And during the ceremony, I, I, there was a large table in the center of the room. It was it was on top of a huge golden pentagram, and um, and they had a, a ceremony there. You know, they. Um, Okay, now how many ki uh, how many other children were with you uh, for being inducted into uh, the family or the order, as uh, the, they call it? There were there were two other children. 
at that point. And there were, but there were several adults too. Okay. Um, see, the church also brings in adults for to swear their allegiance too. Just saying, so you know, um, if my I was told, and I don't know if this is true, but if you to rise to a certain position within the Catholic Church hierarchy, you do have to go through that ceremony as well. Okay, so you're down in this room with uh, your parents weren't present. Uh, no, no, the you, German father and the French father were. Yeah. Okay, and at that point, uh, tell our listeners what you witnessed. Well, um, there was a, a table. It looked like um, dark glass in the center of the room. I mean, it, w- it was made of F stone, but it was very shiny and dark and black. And it may have been something like obsidian or onyx. I'm not sure. You know, I'd have to. Um, that's the only time I've seen stone like that. And it had, uh, like, around the, the corners, they had, like, these gold, um, I guess, channels that, that, that you know, to collect fluids. And a uh, little boy was placed in the center of the table on drugs. He was, I think he was drugged because he was very quiet. He didn't move or say anything during the ceremony. This was a little three- or four-year-old boy? Yes. Correct? Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. they continued to go ahead. They continued to do a child sacrifice. Yes, right they, in did. Front of you. they did. Yes, yeah. I told you about that before. Yeah. Now yeah. afterwards, uh, quite what a you know unbelievable uh, experience for a youth. I mean, for a twelve-year-old. I mean, I, I just uh, how what was what went through your mind? I guess when that happened. I mean, uh, I was terrified. I mean, I was absolutely horrified. I I. I I can't describe the terror you feel when you go through something like that. And do you remember the words they were saying as this was going on? The man was in scarlet. He was speaking in Latin. And basically he, he was saying, you know, please accept the sacrifice, you know, on this day. But then, you know, and then he said the sacrifice will feel that the ceremony, and then he, he did it. Again, I was so terrified that... I, have, have you ever been in a situation where your 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 heart's racing, but you can't do anything, and so you're just kind of sitting there, and, and you're kind of like fading in and out? That's, well, you know, that's kind of, I can remember as a youth being frightened, but I don't think I've ever uh, no. All right. well, gone through anything all quite right, like that you Yeah, have. imagine your heart rate going up to about two. 220, you can't move, so you're kind of shaking, but trying, like, not to show it, mm-hmm. and, and it, I mean, it was horrible, and I, uh, actually, I always keep, keep thinking inside, I can't wait, oh, I can't wait, I mean, you don't say this, but inside, you're just kind of saying over and over, I can't wait till it's over, I can't wait till it's over, I can't wait till mm-hmm. it's over. Afterwards, um, the, the man in Scarlet, he had a huge golden ring on his hand, and he came over to the center of the room, and he had each each of the people that were swearing that day, I had to go forward and kneel before him and kiss his ring and swear my allegiance to the new new order, to the new world order, for all, until my death. Hmm. Now, and, at that point, at that point, you are escorted out. Uh, yes, yeah. And after the ceremony well, was all over. I mean, the other people also... Did theirs as well, you know. They had to swear uh-huh. their allegiance too. And, then and they, they were said, what the same ages? They were the same age as you. The two children were, but they, there were also three adults that went forward and did the same. And afterwards, um, we were told, "May the same to you or worse occur should you ever break this oath." Hmm. So it's basically okay. uh, whew, imagine at that age. What's what's uh, um, and you weren't you really prepped for this, were you? I mean, you were told there was a ceremony, but nothing, you didn't expect anything like this, uh, from what Not, I gathered well, talking I, to you. It, 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 it was very difficult to go through, just because the sense of horrific oppression down there, too, was the worst. I, I mean, I've gone through some ceremonies in my life, in the Illuminati, you, you do go through them. But I have to say that, in my experience, this was the worst, just because I can't explain the amount of darkness in a room like that, just a pure evil. And unless you've ever been in, 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 in a seen oppression, I mean, it's just horrible. It wasn't just what happened, but just, I mean, the, the oppression. And I'm a Christian now, and I know the difference now between when there's evil present, oppression, or, or when God's love is present and joy and peace, which is the exact opposite of what was in that room. 
Now, you know what I find quite interesting about this? Uh, about 25 years ago, I was a reporter and a freelance writer in Rome, and I spent six years there. I walked through the Vatican many, many times, uh, m- hundreds of times, covered the papal addresses, things like that. And during that time, I was there during a Vatican scandal, uh, which involved the church uh, bank and other things, uh, members of the Illuminati, the Freemasons. Uh, I was approached by a woman on Via Veneto. I'll never forget this. Uh, Rome's a small town, and people knew I was covering stories about the secret societies, things like that, because I had to ask people. Well, this woman came up to me and told me similar stories. Uh, she wasn't quite as specific because she couldn't handle it. She would break out crying, yeah. and it tried to commit suicide twice because she couldn't get out of the Illuminati. She was a member, a young, she was, again, born into it, a, a fairly, a very wealthy Ital- northern Italian family, and uh, she told me basically the same ceremony uh, took place with her. And so when I started talking to you, I wanted to relay that to you and to also relate to my listeners that I heard about this 25 years ago uh, from a woman by the name of Maria and many other people, several other people in Italy that I talked to. Uh, I was never able to uh, uh, locate or really, probably for my own safety, never find out what happened. But again, Svali's uh, corroborating a story that I heard about 25 years ago. We'll get back after this break with this incredible story about a member of the Illuminati who's now uh, out of the group and safe on the Republic Broadcasting Network. Okay, uh, we're back on the Investigative Journal. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Greg Szymanski. We're talking to Zvali, a member of the family, uh, the Order, the Illuminati for over 30 years. Uh, Zvali, you leave the induction ceremony, uh, you walk out into the Vatican courtyard, and what do uh, you leave with one of the fathers, I believe? What did he tell you then? At that point, he just told me to never forget that, you know, he told me that I performed well during the ceremony because I didn't scream or, you know, uh, pass out or, or anything like that. So he, he said, you do very well, and he was pleased. And then we went and stayed at, at a home nearby, a, a local, um, it must have been a local person. I didn't know them. We spent the night there before we went back to Germany. Okay, and what about the other people during the ceremony? How did they handle themselves? Do you remember? I'm going to say, unfortunately, I'm so... Um, and when you're in that kind of situation, the last thing they're thinking about sometimes is what the other people are doing. I was just so trying to not, like, lose it myself. And, and that I, I do know that... I mean, no one screamed or shouted, you know, or anything like that. Everyone was quiet. I think to say dead silence is, unless the person was spoken to, is true. Or unless they, they had to go forward and kiss the ring. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. I think we, uh, uh, yeah. the question I wanted to ask you, and this is such a wide subject. I've had a chance to talk to you a number of, number of uh, days, and I've done some stories about it. Uh, you go back home, you're 12 years old. You said you were schooled into 12 disciplines. So your life yeah. begins... Uh, and you know now you're in some type of organization that isn't uh, that is very different than uh, what most people experience. But tell us, you know, I guess what I want to do is leave it open to you to begin. I mean, you've written so in depth on this story. We're, uh, I'm just going to give you the microphone and let you begin and tell uh, tell tell the listeners what you think is important about your original training, about the group, and about. Uh, uh, you know, many things that I know people want to know about the Illuminati. Go ahead. Okay. Well, Greg, first I want to say that my purpose in, in talking about this is not to glorify evil because there, there are very wicked people out there, very powerful people. And I don't want to at all magnify their power, but I want, do want people to know that this is real, that these people exist, that people who say there are people out there that are involved in this activity, it really happens. Um, I also, because I know that there are children being hurt in the group every day, and that's my motivation for coming forward. Um, I don't like giving interviews for obvious reasons. Um, but I'm willing this one time to lay aside my thoughts of personal safety to, because these people need to be stopped. It needs to be stopped. Okay. Okay. Well, go ahead. And, 
Normally, children in, in the group are born into it. Uh, while the Illuminati very rarely does outside recruitment, that's not their main method. It's just passed down generally, generationally from father to son and mother to daughters to children until the whole family line is, is in it. Um, throughout the centuries, people have tried to escape, but um, a lot of times they were um, either poisoned, murdered, or set up to look like a suicide. They, they don't like it when people leave, and they try to make it very difficult, simply because um, it looks bad. <laughs> they go through an enormous amount of training. From the time you're an infant, you, you undergo indoctrination. And when I say indoctrination, I don't just mean like cult programming so much as watching your parents and seeing what they do. My parents modeled their behavior. To them, the group was very important to growing up. I saw that three times a week, Everything was dropped to attend to the activities. Okay. Okay. Um, what a lot of and after through basically the, the the training process is designed to help you take on your adult role in the group. The Illuminati covers so many levels though too. It goes all the way from what most people think of as like a satanic coven type thing at the very low local level. All the way through, it's a huge, enormous business corporation. At the mid-levels, you have people overseeing finances and administration um, who are overseeing. I mean, these people are making a lot of money through gun running, through white slavery, prostitution, pornography. They have links and ties to the mafia left and right. And, in fact, the mafia are afraid of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, think about it. I mean, you know, but but because they know that you don't cross the, you know, the members of the group, they have a very spiritual orientation. They're not satanic, though. They're Luciferian, which is a difference. But mm -hmm. the ultimate goal of, of their spiritual philosophy and their steps of discipline is they believe that that should you complete all your training, that you become a god. That is their actual end goal. They believe in the achievement of godhood of luminous philosophy through different means, through what they call enlightenment or illumination, which is how they got their name. Mm -hmm. um, they're international. Um, uh, in Europe, there's uh, 12 fathers who sit that represent the different nations of Europe. Um, they are very expectantly awaiting he who is to come. And during that ceremony in the Vatican, I... I on my knees, I had to swear my allegiance to serve he who is to come. Hmm. They so, Alec, can you, uh, I have to take a break. We'll continue sure. with the, uh, the the massive organization. Your role as a mid, uh, mid-level mid person in the uh, Illuminati on the Republic Broadcasting Network. Okay, we're back on the Investigate yeah, Journal, and I'm uh, talking with Zvali. Uh, Zvali, why don't we just pick it right up where we left off at the break. Uh, you were telling us about this hierarchy that it starts with 12 fathers. Can you just run that down for us so people know exactly how this group's organized? Sure. Uh, um, at the top levels... It's, it's in Rome. That's the center or the heart of the Illuminati. That's where the power base is. And that's why um, all leadership must wear a fealty in Rome, because that, that's considered the core of, of, of the spiritual center of the universe is how they view it. From there, um, in Europe, there are 12 fathers, one for each country in Europe. Um, when I was younger, too, I had to also I would meet with the fathers um, at one point and kiss their rings and go to another ceremony of allegiance to them as well. Um, there's, uh, in the Illuminati, the European fathers, though, rule over what are called the different houses. For instance, if you're from Germany, then you belong to the German house. If you're from France, you belong to the French house. They call them houses. Um, UK, Russia, Poland, Belgium, um, Spain. Italy, um, and others. Um, from there, uh, America was considered a, a mission field for them. And in the 17, or actually in the 1600s, uh, Pittsburgh became the first port of entry for them, and that's where they first settled. And so that's why it's still considered a, a spiritual power base for the group on the East Coast in the U.S. You know, and I did want to mention one thing. Uh, and a caller or a listener or a reader of your stories sent me an email said, uh, Greg, 
check into the reason why Bush, uh, President Bush, right after being elected, went to Pittsburgh and talked uh, to a Masonic group there. Uh, I found that quite interesting. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's the spiritual power base for, for the group. From there, um, it spread out, it, um, of course, to the Atlantic Seaboard and, and then throughout the nation. And the while the nation is divided into many regions, uh, multiple regions, seven main regions, the East, East Coast region has its spiritual power base in Pittsburgh, but the administrative power base is in Alexandria, Virginia. That's where they administer the finances or the day-to-day operations. The West Coast or the West region or west of the Mississippi has its power base in the San Diego area. And that's where um, you spent a lot of time, correct? Yes, yes. I was okay. sent from the Alexandria Council sent me to San Diego to help them out. Okay, okay um, go ahead. Let's see. Those are the, t- the two, of course, main regions, and then each of those regions are divided into sub-regions. And so then you have your regional council sitting over those and overseeing activities. I mean, if you can think of the structure of a large multinational corporation, that's really how the Illuminati is structured. Then beneath each of the regional councils are your local councils. They call them sister groups or sister, or your local councils, and then you have your local groups under those as well, or what they call the sister groups. So um, any major metropolitan city could have anywhere from 5 to 15 groups, depending on the size population base. Now, you were saying that uh, uh, how many people are in this group in America about, from your estimate uh, of knowing a lot of this stuff? Go ahead. Pure Illuminati, I'd say about 1%, give or take. Based so you're, the, you look, it's a fairly uh, big organization, correct? Yes. Oh, yeah. Now, they're, you know, just in the, in the, uh, their goal, basically, just give us the, over, the broad overview goal, and then I want to get into some of these uh uh, you know, your role in it and uh, some of these uh, re- uh, ways that the Illuminati makes money that you learned about. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, when you say to rule the world, it almost sounds laughable, like, yeah, right. You know, I think people get ideas of, like, thinking in the brain, wanting to rule the world. But really, that is their goal. They believe that they are the intelligent leaders, and they believe that the rest of the world are sheep who need, need wise. They see themselves as wise leadership, so they they believe that their goal is is to rule the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, but at the same time, um, they have ways of doing this. Their main methods of doing so are behind the scenes. They believe in infiltration of the media, of education, and of government. Those are the three areas, and of the financial system. And they've successfully done quite a bit of all four throughout Europe and the U.S., as well as other countries. Now, you said that they, you're basically the uh, Illuminati is divided into about six or seven different groups, and everyone is born into a group. Can you outline what those groups are? Well, no, it's, it's all one group, but it just has different levels, you know. Yeah, um, that's what I mean, like the yeah. sciences, the government. Oh, 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 uh, well, it's, no, okay, the Illuminati is divided into different branches of learning. And okay. th- these branches include sciences, military, government, leadership, scholarship, and spiritual. Those okay. are the six branches of learning. And while all children need to undergo some training or teaching in, in each area, as they get older, they, they, they begin profiling you from infancy, and they know where your aptitudes and abilities are. Then you are you really go into you, most people specialize in, in one branch or possibly two branches of learning. And you were involved in what branch? I was heavily involved in sciences. And also, uh, to some degree, uh, I did some spiritual as well, but mainly hey, sciences. Uh, just to backtrack one minute, these 12 disciplines, as a child, you were uh, regularly trained in this, correct? Yes. Okay. And what were those disciplines?
were those disciplines? I mean, if just uh, you don't have to go through each one of them, but what primarily were you taught? Um, I think the best way would be to just give you an example of just one one type of training that they do. Okay. When I, I was two years old, I was left in a room for probably a 24-hour period. When you're that age, it's hard to estimate, but it was a long time. I know that the sun did go around <laughs> at least once. You know, it wasn't just like a few hours. And at that age, when you're two and you're left completely alone without food and water, you're terrified. And at the end of the... the the um, time I was, I was just dying of thirst. I remember I was just, I, I've never been so thirsty in my entire life. And my mother were, walked into the room because a lot of times they have the children, you know, or the parents as train the children at these early ages. And there was a table in the middle of the room, and I'm sitting at, and she sits at, and she brings in this cold pitcher of water, and she starts pouring it. I said, "Mom, I want a drink of water," and she slapped me out of the chair. And I remember crying, and I'm like, and, and, and as I'm crying, and she's drinking the water in front of me, and she leaves. She takes a pitcher of water, and a couple of hours later, she came back in and did the same thing. I said, Mama, Mama, I want water, and she slapped me, I mean, across the room. And after this had happened about three times, luckily I was bright enough that by the third time she came in, I mean, I remember crying violently. I just looked at her. I didn't ask. And after she got up and left with the pitcher, then, then a, man, a man came into the room. He said, you did very well that time. And then he, he gave me a drink of water. Hmm. And, I don't, you know, this, that was part of the learning not to want stage. And looking back on it, rise now as an, an adult, but the purpose of that, that training was to teach me not to recognize my own physiological needs and respond to them, but to look to outside people to tell me what I wanted or needed. Which now, is, you basically, is, uh, you know, you told me that you led kind of a dual life in the Illuminati. I mean, that's basically how they function. They have a, oh, yeah. Yeah. a day job, and then at nighttime you're quite oh, busy yeah. sometimes with the cult's activities, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to get into, uh, if you, you know, you were talking about these groups. I remember I mentioned to you, uh, you were going, you said you had meetings three times a week. And I said, well, what about if I wanted to go and visit? Uh, maybe do a story about them. What uh, what would happen, or how could would I be able to find one of these meetings uh, that were going on where in your area of Escondido? Well, no, because of the security measures. And a, you really don't want to show up unannounced at a meeting if you could get through the security, because chances are you would never make it out alive. Let's just okay. say that a sudden auto accident would occur, and be reporting the papers. Unfortunate accident, man accidentally <laughs> runs into a tree. I mean, I'm serious. I'm, but the security that they have during group meetings is, is so intense that it would be very difficult. They have uh, security at the one-mile perimeter, the three-mile perimeter, and the five-mile perimeter. They have um, three people assigned, usually one like up in a tree where you can't see them, at the, mm -hmm. the five-mile perimeter, and then you have one person who's standing who looks like a security guard for the state because these are off the march of these states, which is appropriate, and he's dressed in the uniform. And the third person standing behind, hidden behind a tree. As cars come through and they come through the gates, because remember, these are, off, these are gated estates. Mm -hmm. you, know, so that, you know, if it's not someone on their approved license checklist, they will stop the car and they say, it's, it's, it's just like at a military um, installation. They'll say, can I help you? Are you lost? Their goal is to delay the person. Now, if a person saying, oh, is this blah, 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 and they're, in the, and, they, and they're just asking directions, they'll give them directions, they'll be very pleasant and send them on their way to, to mm -hmm. where they're supposed to be going. But if they are acting as if they want to go further into the state, and this is not an okay person, then the person, they will say, uh, all right, well, let's, 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 you can say he's not expecting you. That's a code word. That tells the person either behind, up in the tree, hidden, or else behind, hidden further back. They radio ahead and they say, unexpected visitor. At that point, everyone would, has been trained to pick up and leave immediately within five minutes. No traces of the activity. Hmm. So this is, this is some of the methods they go through so you don't get caught. 
I know that uh, you wrote an article about why the occult doesn't get caught, and that's oh, yeah. pretty specific. I mean, you have so much stuff here, and we can't get into it all in two hours. So please pick and choose what you think is most important. But I found that to be interesting, uh, why the occult doesn't get caught. Is there anything in just a brief uh, time you could explain to us uh, that? Well, their security, their money, their influence. Uh, some of these people even own newspapers. Imagine trying to get a, a, a article published, you know, disclosing. Um, there's a lot of reasons why they don't get caught, because that's the first thing people ask. But then my next question is, how many top pornographers are out there that the police have been chasing for years and have never found or caught? Correct. And, the, and, the, and they're yeah. not even members of a secret organization. They're just trying to hide, you know. So mm -hmm. when you now you... Okay. Yeah. You are a mid-level person in this organization, a head trainer. We're going to get into those specifics in the next hour. But, you know, what did you learn about the infiltration of this group into all of our different areas of government, uh, media? Uh, they're basically at the high levels of most of our financial institutions also, correct? Yeah. And... That is a, a great way to uh, pursue their goal. And I guess i got to ask you this. Why, how come things are moving a little bit uh, faster in America now? I remember back in the 80s when I was uh, confronted with this, uh, when I came back home, I didn't really see uh, this kind of New World Order movement, all this different symbolism that you see now. Uh, what is going on just for our listeners uh, right now? Why are things stepped up since 9-11? I believe it's because they see they can see the fulfillment of their goal of see I, I'm gonna sound very cynical now and okay. please forgive me for this, but see, their goal is to rule the world and personally I believe that they do, it's just not open yet. Mm -hmm. And they see now preparing people for when they disclose it themselves openly. Does that mean that they can't be stopped? I believe they could. I believe they'd take a miracle because of the amount of infiltration I've seen at all levels of society and the world. These guys have, a, these people have, and women have a lot of money. They have a lot of influence. And your average person has no idea of, of how much that they, it is going on behind the scenes that no one understands. But with that said, so basically, I mean, I think that they're already there. They just aren't open. These people just don't know what they're doing. If they did, I think the average person would be horrified to know how much is going on behind the scenes that, that People really don't know. Yeah, and the point of this interview, one, I had two point, uh, two goals but, but, in this but, interview. But, but, but I don't Go want ahead. to sound despairing because I, I'm also a strong Christian. I have faith in God, and I believe that through prayer and through people knowing that, I mean, I, I would like them to be stopped. I just don't know at this point, how do you take on the financial institutions of the world, the, the major oil enterprises of the world? <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it is, it is a, it's a difficult question. Now, you're in the mid-level of this group. You worked your way up to a head trainer, correct? Yeah, yeah. Now, what did you learn? Uh, before we get into the specifics, you, you outlined in some of your writings the big money-making, uh, uh, the ways these, uh, this group makes its money. Can you go over and outline some of those uh, methods? Um, again, if you can think of an illegal activity, they're probably involved at some point. Maybe not overtly at, at the point of where the actual money is first changing hands, but any when you have child pornography, prostitution, white slavery, gun running, gambling, um, then at some point where the money is changing hands, about four buffered by about four layers of people, there's going to be probably someone from the Illuminati involved at that point. These guys have their fingers in everything. Um, no, go ahead. But they also use legitimate means. They launder their money. I mean, when you have a lot of money, you have to do something with it. And so what they'll quite, they, I mean, these men don't come in and say, hi, I'm a member of the Illuminati, and I want to, like, run your bank. But what they'll do is they'll quietly come in and become a, a quiet investor, start buying up shares. And over a period of maybe almost a lifetime, they will get a controlling interest in the bank. Or else become a very, you know, and maybe in their son's lifetime, because that's the other thing about the Illuminati. The Illuminati do not see it as it must happen now in my lifetime. These people have goals that last for a century or two centuries. They're very, very that's, patient. 
And that's why the specific training of the children is so important, correct? Yes. Yes, it's to teach you patience. Everyone mm-hmm. knows growing up in the group, they know that we may not see the coming order disclosed or open or revealed in that lifetime, but our children or our grandchildren may. So they will spend their entire life trying to bring about the goals of the organization. <laughs> Incredible. So now you're in the uh, mid-level, and I can see now where they use the uh, programming techniques, the different mind control techniques. Yeah. Uh, we had a minute before the break, just kind of uh, what our interest about how you, uh, what your specific uh, role was. Well, they did a lot of what you might call human experimentation. And they had a lot of research protocols going on. So one thing I did was to supervise the research going on. I was, I was teaching the younger trainers and, and head trainers how to do things more efficiently, how to do their job well, but also reviewing their research reports for errors or problems. Eventually, um, I became kind of a consultant. If a problem occurred or if they, were, they didn't know how to install something or if they needed assistance, I would help them with, with problem solving as well. Okay, Zvali, I'm going to attempt to take a break. We'll be back in three minutes. We'll continue. One thing I find interesting, Zvali, is, you know, in the media, uh, you know, I'm not going to name names or anything else. I don't have any specific information. But I find it interesting uh, doing some background checks and a lot of the top media people in our country, they all come from these very wealthy families. And, uh, you know, that's not the typical M.O. for a journalist, Uh a journalist is somebody, uh, you know, grows up on the street, wants to, wants to talk to people. I mean, I, I can think of Jimmy Breslin, uh, guys who uh, never went to college, uh, didn't know how to type, and just got in there and took their tie off and started writing stories. But, you know, as you look at the media now, these are all these silver spoon kids growing up with silver spoons. I find that quite interesting. How deeply infiltrated, from your knowledge, are they in our media? Wow. Um, pretty, I mean, I do know uh, fairly deeply. Uh, I remember that when I was in San Diego on leadership council during meetings, they would laugh about how people had no idea of how much they were, they were being influenced and didn't even know it. They, they found that kind of amusing, which is, I mean, that's the mindset of people in the group. Though, is they're like, the sheep has no idea that they're being led by the nun. And right. they find it amusing because they show it as evidence of this. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm just describing what they say. I don't agree with it now, but they, they saw it as evidence of the stupidity of the, of the average person that they have no idea. Um, I'm not saying that every news story or every newscaster is a member of the group by no means. And but there's they specifically do teach and train and educate children to show an aptitude for it for the media. Because they want that. And if a person has a bright, charismatic personality and presents well, then that's just a, a that child will go into that if, if, you know, if they have the verbal communication and other skills required. Correct. And, you know, that uh, could explain why a lot of our stories really never get covered outside of the influence they have financially that's and the ownership of the media. Absolutely not by coincidence. Uh, what's not that? A, not at all a coincidence. Yeah, so I mean that's a, uh, a good idea why folks you're not getting the news from those outlets. I mean we have uh, not only in our government it explains you know a lot of things. I mean why look at the war in Iraq. Look at the you know the the evidence there that shows that it was wrong. Look at what they're doing in Iran right now. I mean it's incredible uh, uh, all this stuff. Uh, it's pretty obvious people you know there's something behind it. Zvali is here trying to explain this organization from her knowledge, and it's quite quite a story. Uh, I know this idea. You were involved as a trainer, mind programming. I mean, this is just. I'm looking at some of the uh, chapters in a book you have yet to publish. I mean, we're talking about brainwave, uh, color control, uh, metal, jewel programming, programming linked to stories, movies. Uh, I mean, it goes suicidal program. Uh, and just a minute here before I break. Uh, can you kind of break down what you learned about the importance? Well, oh, we got to take a break, Zvali. Sorry. We're going to do that quickly. Then we'll get back to you. Uh, we're talking to Zvali regarding her role as a head trainer in the Illuminati and the American uh, uh, Illuminati. We'll be back on the Republic Broadcasting Network in two minutes. 
Okay, we're back on the Investigative Journal. Uh, one more hour, we're talking to Zvali, and she was a head trainer in the Illuminati. Uh, Zvali, how, uh, what type of programming uh, do, they actually under, uh, do they actually teach you, and how do you learn these uh, different techniques? Um, well, you're, you're taught from childhood on. I, my training in how to be a programmer for is very young. I was mentored by another programmer at the age of five uh, by uh, a doctor at George Washington University. And he, he not only did he do the programming on me, but he also taught me how to do it to others. Um, the types of programming, again, that could be a whole 10-hour segment to go into depth. Um, just briefly, it, I mean, from the time a child's an infant, all through their life, basically, they're tested, they're profiled. They, the um, trainers can create a psychological profile, and then they update it frequently. And basically, they're trying to install in the child the ability to obey, loyalty to the group, and the ability to do their job within the, the group. Now, those jobs vary in complexity. I mean, you may have, uh, on one side, a child trained to get a prostitute. On the other end, you may have someone, a child trained to become a governmental figure, which is a lot more complex programming. But as long as the loyalty to the group is instilled first, and that's the first and foremost programming always installed, then no matter what their eventual role is, they will, they will remain loyal, and that becomes their first loyalty. Whatever nation, whatever um, their, their public role in life is, their first and foremost loyalty will be to the group and to serve its, its goals. Whether they know, a lot of times the goal of the two is, is to be able to uh, help the child create that complete division between their day role and their night role. So a pleasant, charming, wonderful, kind person in the daytime could be an absolutely cold, ruthless person at night or, or during the day. You know, it's also during the day they do it. They may, um, you may have a housewife with children who goes out and completes a courier job for the group. And no one would ever suspect her. Who, but this, this funky looking little housewife with a, a baby in a car seat is actually carrying some valuable documents. Or, um, again, I mean, the, the first and foremost though is they want to instill loyalty and they want to discourage people from questioning orders. That's, they really don't want you questioning that, and they need you to obey their directives. And should people show signs of not doing that, then they go in for tips. You're, you're, actually, people are being programmed all through their life. We used to call them tune-ups, you know, and um, it, it's a lifelong process for members of the group. So, you know, we have a minute here before our break, and then we'll get back and get in-depth in some of these areas. But uh, what went wrong with you? I mean, the dropout rate probably is very low. Uh, considering the number of, considering the the training, but what went wrong with you? They somehow uh, missed a, missed something. When I was very young, I was I absolutely believed in the goals of it. You never saw a more loyal group member. I thought that they were saving the world. I thought that 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 they were doing a wonderful thing. But the older I got, I started to see the methods that were being used were so wrong and that the end did not justify the means. I became increasingly cynical, partly because I saw what I was doing to people. I was lying to them. I was manipulating them. I was telling them things that weren't true. And I remember questioning this, thinking, I was told lies as a child, too, then. I was manipulated. And finally, wow. you know, things like that, you start to question as an adult the things you believe. Okay. All right, we're going we're gonna to take a uh, break, so I'll be back in three minutes uh, on the Republic Broadcasting Network. Okay, we're back uh, on the Investigative Journal. Uh, Zavali, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, before we get into how you finally left the group and uh, what happened to you afterwards, your life now, tell us, uh, you wrote an article, it was kind of interesting, A Day in the Life of a Trainer for the Illuminati. Tell us kind of what you went through in a normal day uh, in your role at the Illuminati. Go ahead. Okay. Basically, I would get up. Um, I, at the time that I described in that article, I was teaching at a Christian school. And so I would get up. Uh, I, I would get my two children. I dressed ready for school. 
um, look just like a normal mom, you know, uh, go through the day, come home, you know, we'd have little friends over and play and stuff like that. And, and then, uh, uh, you know, have dinner, you know, I, I, was a, I was a good mom. I was your average American housewife, I mean, on the surface. Okay. But, but underneath the surface, then my husband and I would remind each other on nights when there was a meeting. And then what we would do is, is when we go to sleep, I, I, have, I have programming in place that would allow me to wake up within 10 minutes of a specified time. So if I knew there was a meeting that night, I would wake up 10 minutes before it was time to, you know, get ready and go. A lot of times we would even go to bed with our clothes on. And I never thought that was that normal, you know. Mm-hmm. I thought everyone went to bed with their clothes on. Didn't even question it, you know, on nights when we had meetings. I thought, oh, it's warmer. <laughs> Okay. And then we we get up and, and go and um, drive to the meeting. And I was also very involved in military in San Diego. In fact, the group has a lot of military orientation. And so a lot of times I would uh, take the kids to their area. There's the area where the kids would go and change. They had a room, and we would have, like, baskets of clothes, and we'd change our clothing. You'd take out your clothing, you know, it had your name on it, and put on your uniform or whatever you wore that night. And the kids would wear these little miniature military uniforms. And then they would go out and do their training exercises. They were learning how to march, how to shoot. I mean, every, I mean, I, all kids in Illuminati know, um, at least in, in that area, know how to, like, take apart a gun, put it together, and, and shoot with deadly accuracy by the age of eight years old. Um, martial arts, there's a lot of martial arts training. Sometimes that helps supervise that. Or fill in if, if a military trainer was, because, you know, you had to know how to do it. Everyone had to be, there's a lot of cross training. But most of the time I supervised the training. I would be working on um, implementing programming or or what I call, we call tuning up, you know, um, reinforcing previously installed programming in adults. At that point, I was normally supervising the younger trainers. They would be doing it, and I would be there watching and making sure they did it correctly. Um, or else, um, I would be also evaluating like whether sometimes every once in a while we'd be doing we'd be, be working on something that was somewhat experimental, and then I'd be and then I would be taking a more active role, assessing the person's responses to to the new protocol, recording it and and if there was any difference difference between established parameters for that protocol or expected responses, you know I'd be flagging that. Give me an example of someone that you were working on. What? Uh, how would they be introduced? What would be the reason? Are they in the military? What is? Uh, how does someone get sent to you? No, these were all members of the group. Oh, okay. Oh, oh in fact, well, in fact, I, I can tell you that in San Diego, twenty percent of the active members of the group were active military. Okay. Okay, and think of military intelligence. Think high-ranking um, officials, colonels. Um, you know, commanders. My ex-husband was a lieutenant commander in the Navy, getting ready to become a commander, okay? Right. These are not stupid people. So you're basically um, involved in pro- working on the programming of the members involved, too? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, no. We didn't program people that weren't members of the group. You cannot install significantly traumatic mind control programming in a person who is not a member of the group. Now, there are okay. certain um, – now, what you can do is what we call passive programming, which is basically through media means. You know, you can set – if someone's watching a television program, they go immediately into alpha state. Everyone in the group – I mean, even a baby in the group knows that because these people are very much into behavioral psychology, and that's a, a trance state almost, a very relaxed state where messages can be implemented. And that's why I very strongly suggest people be very careful about the TV shows they watch. That's all I'll say about that. But, but no, you cannot take an adult who's not a member of the group and do what we did to them. They would go psychotic or or they, they wouldn't survive it, probably. They wouldn't be uh, able to us, psychologically handle it. Tell us some examples of what you were doing, program techniques. Sometimes... It would involve, uh, sometimes, normally it would start with a hypnotic induction or even sometimes we'd inject a medication. A lot of times, especially young children, have a lot of fear when they're going into programming, but adults did too. We want them to relax. We'd give them a very short-acting uh, medication to relax them. We would then 
um, invoke a hypnotic state in them. We would then, um, like if it's an older person, I'd be checking that the code's already installed. If I was getting ready to install programming in it, in like a young child, I would tell them, explain to them very patiently exactly the behavior expected. I'd say, I want you to do this and this and this. I'd break it up into steps, and I'd say, first, we're going to practice this. I would show the child what I want them to do. I'd model it. I would then tell the child, do it. The child would then do it, okay. But normally they won't do it well the first time, so she, would, she or he would get shot. That was called, because the group very much uses what they call positive and negative reinforcement. Okay, if the child did not do it perfectly the first time, they're shocked. That's the negative reinforcement. But I'd say, do it again. They would show me the behavior. Now, at this point, we start associating the, the behavior with an external stimulus or cue, too. Now, a lot of times the child is, if, if this is a behavior, though, that we want associated with a specific code, the child will often have been traumatized very heavily first to create a fragmentation in their personality, and then the code, and then the behavior and the associated cue are given. Like, you might hear a tone like, bing, bing, bing. All right, I want you to do this, bing, bing, bing. The child hears the tone, they get up, and they do the behavior. Once they can perform it perfectly, they're rewarded with praise, good job, or a hug, children like hugs, or something like that. Then you do it over and over and over. That's why trainers have to be very patient people. Um, because then maybe after the child's done it 50 times, then they hear the cue, they get up, they do it. it it's not even a, a conscious, it's, it's reflective. At that point, it's considered installed. For very, very important programming, I'm talking about like like end level assassin programming because we did train people how to assassinate people, and that's a whole other topic that I don't want to go into here. Um, okay. We, we would then do a ritual to to heal the programming afterwards. Okay. Okay. You know something? Just uh, I was just looking at some of your articles, and one was Christmas in the cult. Just to get off on a different subject here, sure. and you say this is quite different for you when you were growing up than it is for most children. Can you just kind of briefly tell us what you meant by that? Yeah, um, I mean, we had trees and presents and things like that. But for most children, Christmas is just happy time, you know, lots of presents. But in the group, not, some very high ceremonies that are celebrated. A lot, uh, several times, at many times, I flew to, to Germany, and there um, there was no Santa Claus. They had a figure called Father Yule, who is... Mm -hmm who represents Christmas there, but he is not the kind of benevolent Santa that you see here. This is a man with a golden scepter dressed in a white robe and a golden sash around, and I was once um, at the German father's house where there was a gathering of children and adults, and, and Father Yule was present, and he raises the scepter and basically um, strikes down the child in front of everyone. Oh, my God. I know, Strikes down I know. the child, right? Yes, he struck down the child with his, his, his scepter, and that that is not what you call a happy Christmas, you know. No. Now, at the same time, yes, we did have tree, and, you know, and, and fruitcake and all that and, and decorate the house, but there's another side to Christmas. It's, it's, uh, you know, I'm just listening, and I just can't believe, you know, we're, you know, it's it's we got leaders in our country that have probably gone through this kind of stuff. I mean, uh, it's just incredible, this group. I mean, I know they've been around for a long, long time, thousands of years, and gone through, came here. George Washington was a 33rd degree Mason, oh, yeah. uh, and we go on. Uh, the question, you know, I just, I want you to, uh, to understand what, just from my point of view, I, I just wonder how, you know, you write a story, The End of the Illumina. How do we get rid of these people? I know you're out of it. Uh, you couldn't take it anymore, but do you think we can we can inspire more mid-level people to just leave like you, so they have no one to do this kind of insidious, crazy uh, programming and lifestyle? Uh, what what do you what do you think? Well, I believe that that as strongly as a Christian, that it's a spiritual warfare as as well as a, a emotional and psychological warfare. I believe that by the grace of God. But I will also say that when I was in the group, a lot of the members are not happy. You you will have people in the group that are there because they love it, because they believe in the goals, they're totally dedicated. But to be honest, a lot I knew also knew as many people who would have left in a minute if they thought that they could get out and make it. And you know, about your husband, 
Uh, just yeah. to break in, then go back to that. Do, do, do they marry you to somebody in the group, or is that yeah. forced on yeah. you? No, in the in the group, the marriages are always arranged. In my my experience, in my 38 years in the group, I never knew of a couple in in the Illuminati that did not have an arranged marriage. It's, it's Let me just planned. mention a couple that I I suspect Clinton and uh, Bill and Hillary. Oh well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes, definite, definite. Yes, and, Bill. And yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and yeah, a lot okay. of times these marriages are arranged for compatibility, but also for bloodlines, to bring the right bloodlines together. Okay, good. We're going to be back in three minutes. Huh?